You know, the thing about names, right? We, we, we live in a culture where things are named, you know? You, you rarely come across anything that doesn't have a specific name. And we've been talking about who is this Jesus. We started talking about this a few weeks ago. And here's the thing about where Jesus is from. And we read in Scripture, I shared that Scripture from Matthew chapter 2. The thing about the name Nazarene that Jesus went by because he was from Nazareth, you know, that's not a name you would ever use if you wanted to appeal to the right people, to the beautiful people. Not ever would you use the name Nazarene. It's a name that would only be useful to show you were indeed, you were in fact who you really are. Uh, you, you weren't a pretender. You weren't a phony. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, 23, we, we saw that. We, we, I read that a little bit earlier. This whole, um, this whole concept of where Jesus was from. He was from this town of Nazareth called Jesus the Nazarene. That's how he came by that name. And there's some things that that name tells us that are very, very important about who Jesus is. Here's the first thing I want you to catch. I want you to get this. Obviously, the name describes where he was from. It tells you about Jesus' roots in Nazareth. Has anyone here ever been to Nazareth in the Middle East? Anybody? I know maybe there's some folks. Okay, okay. If you've been there in the Middle East, all right, that's awesome. But here's what you need to know. Nazareth, the town was located on a major road that led from the Mediterranean Sea to Syria and northern Palestine. But there was nothing ever specifically mentioned in this town, in particular in the Old Testament, except it does show up a few times in the New Testament. And there's some archaeological evidence that suggests that people had moved there from the region in and around the town of Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, it helps us to explain a verse that we read about from Luke chapter 2, verse 4, where Luke writes, So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in, Judea, in Judah, David's town for a census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. As one writer puts it about Nazareth, it was the sort and size of town where everybody would know everyone else's business. Anybody ever grow up in a town like that, where it seemed like everybody knew everybody's business? That's the kind of town Nazareth was. And this is where the Savior of the world was from, this little old town, Nazareth, a town that was unspectacular, and actually there's estimates that point that its population was anywhere between 500 to a couple of thousand people. Anybody here ever heard of a town called Midway, Alabama? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Midway, Alabama. Midway, Alabama, it's 2020 population, 421 people. And the median income way back in 2000 for Midway, Alabama, was $12,143. That's what you made if you lived in Midway, Alabama a year. That's where my family is from. The Daniels family is originally from a small town in Bullock County, Alabama, Midway. My uncle told me that Midway, like Nazareth, was a sort of town growing up in, it could be a problem if you did something. Because if you did something, Everybody knew about it. I remember one of my very first trips uh, to my uh, grandparents' home in Alabama. And my grandfather kept telling me to stay away from the whale out in the yard. And I thought, they have a whale down here? Wow, I thought, I live in New York City. We don't have any whales in our yards. This may be a small town, but that's very cool. I mean, you know? It wasn't until a few years later that I realized that my grandfather's southern accent made well <laughs> sound like whale. So Jesus, Jesus is from this small, obscure town, like Midway. But what is that about? The negative reaction to where Jesus is from, there was a, a negative reaction to Jesus' roots. It's actually mentioned in John's gospel as well. John chapter 1 and verse 40, 
We read this account. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John's witness and followed Jesus. The first thing he did after finding uh, where Jesus lived was to find his own brother, Simon, and telling him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Jesus took one look up and said, you're John's son, Simon. From now on, your name is Cephas or, or Peter, which means rocks. Rock. And the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And when he got there, he ran across Philip and said, come follow me. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida. It was the same as Andrew and Peter. And Philip, <laughs> you see what's happening here? These, these people are all finding other people to go tell about Jesus. So Philip went out and he found Nathaniel. And he told him, we found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Nazareth? You got to be kidding. Now, that's what the message translation says. <laughs> okay. But in other translations, the question is posed, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, Philip was shocked that the savior of the nation of Israel, the one whose coming was foretold by Moses, the prophets of old, was from Nazareth? The only way I can relate to what Philip and the other religious leaders of the day would have thought is to think that Jesus was coming from Midway, Alabama. Huh. What kind of roots are those for king? Gordon McDonald said this about Jesus. He said, I think... We need to be constantly reminded that Jesus, by the standards of cultural success models, was a miserable failure. What Matthew is most likely telling us in this, this verse that comes to us from chapter 2, verse 23, what's also affirmed by Nathaniel's reaction, Nathaniel's reaction to Luke's uh, gospel is that Jesus, the Messiah, he would be scorned. He would be despised. Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. We read these words. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling. He's describing the, the coming Messiah. A scrubby plant in a parched field. There's nothing attractive about him. Nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him and thought he was scum. That leads us right to this, to what I would say is the next aspect of this name of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, that we need to examine together this morning. By being called Jesus the Nazarene, we also come to grasp this idea that this name describes other people's view of him as well. This is description of how people will see him. It was accompanied by ridicule. There can be no doubt as you read through the pages of the New Testament accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, there's overwhelming scorn and derision of him. And let's start where the thought that this was the end of this person known as Jesus is spoken of in this account coming from us, coming to us from John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 17, the, the time that Jesus is going to the cross. We read these words, carrying his cross. Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill. The name in Hebrew is Golgotha where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. And Pilate wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross. It said, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Friends, a lot of times we can skip past this. That was a mocking, a mocking sign that Pilate put up. It was another way of signifying to anyone who would be around in that time, in that, at that time of the, that place in the world, that Jesus was from nowhere, and at the same time, Jesus was nobody. So mocking him as the so-called 
king of the Jews. Psalms writes this. This is what we read in Psalms from King David in Psalm 22, beginning in verse 6. This is about the suffering Messiah, the suffering anointed one, the one who is to come. We read these words, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Ah, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. It would seem that even Jesus' own family and friends, they verbally assailed Jesus for doing what he was sent into our world to do. Mark writes about this in chapter 3, where Jesus' family reached the conclusion that Jesus was literally out of his mind. They said, Jesus, you're crazy. Mark 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus left there and returned to his hometown, which would have been Nazareth. His disciples came along, and on the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit in pressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden? Get such ability. But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. Ah, he's just a carpenter. Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. They, they never got any farther. And, and Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his hometown among his relatives on the streets where he played as a child. And Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He, he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left, made a circuit of other villages teaching. Jesus continually faced ridicule for being from Nazareth. Everywhere he turned, everyone he crossed paths with seemed to take issue with his background. So what does this mean? What does this mean for you and for me? Here's what I think it means, quite simply. Jesus identifies with the outcast. Jesus identifies with the forgotten. Jesus identifies with those who are despised, those who are ashamed. He said it so succinctly in Luke chapter 5, verse 30, after having the meal with a lowly tax collector. Anybody remember that tax collector's name starts with a Z? Anybody? Zacchaeus, right? We read these words. The Pharisees... And their religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What's he doing? Eating and drinking with, with crooks and sinners, like a tax collector. Jesus heard about it and spoke up. He said, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life. Changed inside and out. Jesus faces, he, he brings out, it seems, the ridicule, wherever he may be. All of that he faced is the means by which all of us can have peace with God. Because Jesus went through that, we too. We know what that's like. What is known about this Jesus, the Nazarene? Even, maybe even when all else is forgotten, what do you remember? What should you remember? What's important to remember about Jesus the Nazarene? I may have shared this before, but one of my favorite authors is a gentleman by the name of Philip Yancey. And uh, he shared this story, and it stuck with me for so many years. Philip Yancey talked about the fact that his wife, led a weekly Christian circle at a nursing home. And there was an Alzheimer's patient named Betsy who faithfully attended. 
She would be led there by the staff worker and she would sit through that hour. Every week, Philip's wife, Janet, introduces herself and every week, Betty responds as if she's never seen her before. After a few weeks, Janet learned that Betty had retained the ability to read. She has no comprehension of what she's reading and will repeat the same line over and over like a stuck record until someone prompts her to move on. But on a good day, on a good day, she can read a message straight through in a clear, strong voice. And Philip Yancey's wife, Janet, began calling on her each week to read a hymn. And one Friday, the senior citizens who prefer older hymns they remember from childhood, they selected the old rugged cross. Anybody ever heard of that song, the old rugged cross? They wanted Betsy to read that. So on a hill far away stands an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. She began and then she stopped. And she suddenly got really agitated. I can't go on. It's too sad. It's too sad, she said. And some of the other seniors around her, they kind of, they kind of gasped. Others just stared at her, dumbfounded. In years of living at home, not once had Betty shown the ability to put words together meaningfully. Now, obviously, she did understand. Janet calmed her down. It's fine, Betty. It's fine, Betty. You don't have to keep reading if you don't want to. After a pause, though, she started reading again, and she stopped in the same place. A tear made a trail down her face. She said, I can't go on. It's so sad. So sad. She was unaware that she had said the same thing two minutes ago. And she tried again and again, reacting with a sudden shock and recognition, grief at the same exact words every time. Finally, when Betty seemed tranquil, Janet led her to the elevator to return her to her room. And to her amazement, Betty began singing the hymn from memory. The words came in breathy, chopped phrases, and she could barely carry the tune, carry the tune, but anyone would recognize the hill, the hymn. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And now new tears were falling. But this time, Betsy kept going, still from memory gaining strength as she sang, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Somewhere in her tattered mind, damaged neurons tapped into a network of old connections, resurrecting a pattern of meaning for Betsy. In her confusion, two things stood out, suffering and shame. And these two words summarize our human condition, the condition she lives in every day of her sad life. Who knows more suffering and shame than Betsy? For her, that him answered that question. Jesus does. Jesus knows suffering and shame. Jesus, the Nazarene, knows all about our suffering and shame.
Would you pray with me? Who is the Son of God? Jesus the Nazarene. The one who knew what it was like to be mocked, to be dismissed, to suffer, to be put to shame. He identifies with us, God. Jesus, your son, identifies with us. We are all outsiders. We are all um, struggling. Lord, we are in a battle. It's a battle that you have promised through Jesus to provide us victory. And Father, as we take time to remember who you are. God, may we also remember what you've done for us. Father, in a few moments, we're going to take time to physically walk through a remembrance of what you have done for us. And God, it's not just what you did one time. You continue to speak to the Father on our behalf. Your blood still speaks. We thank you for that. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.